who were friends with Walt Whitman. Uh, I never fail to amaze myself with what I can find. I, I never heard of this, but I think you all kind of have a feeling of who Walt Whitman was. He was born in 1819 in West Hills, Long Island. He was the second son of Walter Whitman, a house builder, and Louisa Van Velsler. In the, 19, in the 1820s and 30s, the family, which con consisted of nine <coughs> children, lived in Long Island in Brooklyn, where Whitman uh, attended the public schools. Now, after, it, I won't read you the whole thing, but he worked as a printer in New York City. He was involved with the newspapers and learned how to write articles for newspapers. He, in Brooklyn, Whitman developed his poetry skills. And he, later, his style of poetry, Ralph Waldo Emerson said it amazed me what the man could do. In 1855, Whitman took out a copyright for the first edition of Leaves of Grass. That one is connected with Albion. Uh, consisted of 12 untitled poems and a preface. At the outbreak of the Civil War, Whitman vowed to live a purged and cleansed life. He worked as a freelance journalist and visited the wounded New York City area hospitals. He then traveled to Washington, D.C. in December of 1862 to care for his brother who'd been wounded in the war. Overcome by the suffering of many wounded in Washington, Whitman decided to stay and work in the hospitals. He took a job as a clerk for the Bureau of Indian Affairs in the Department of the Interior, which ended when the Secretary of Interior, James Harlan, discovered that Whitman was the author of Leaves of Grass, which Harlan found offensive. After Harlan fired him, he went to work in the Attorney General's office. In 1873, Whitman suffered a stroke that left him partially paralyzed. A few months later, he traveled to Camden, New Jersey to visit his dying mother at his brother's house. He ended up staying with his brother until the 1882 publication of Leaves of Grass, which brought him enough money to buy a home in Camden. In the simple two-story clapboard house, Whitman spent his declining years working on additions and revisions to his deathbed edition of Leaves of Grass and preparing his final volume of poems and prose. After his death on March 26, 1892, Whitman was buried in a tomb he designed and had built a lot in Harley Cemetery. Along with Emily Dickinson, he's considered one of America's most important poets. <clears throat> so that was Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman is what ties these two women together in Albion. The first woman is Juliet Hayward. She was the daughter of Alexander Hayward and Harriet M. Herrick here in Albion. Um, she eventually married Calvin Beach. Calvin Beach was, ran the newspaper here in Albion. Um, it was Beach, G -H -G, yeah. C G Beach and Company, Albion, proprietors of Orleans Republican Steam and Job Printing Establishment, third story Swan's Block, corner of Main and Bank. So that is where the newspaper was. Um, Excuse me, is that yeah. the, the old Swan Library? No, no, it's far as downtown. Yeah. Or bank or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and they were, Juliet and her husband Calvin were the parents of Florence, and she married Sanford Church. So that's the, the connection there to what's going on in Albion. Um, and Sanford Church had the big White House that's on, was it Ingersoll? Or the funeral home. Yeah, it was the funeral home, yeah. That was their 
daughter's husband's house. That's where their daughter and her husband live. Um, <laughs> Juliet was listed in 1869 as the owner and editor of the Orleans Republic. She and her husband ran it. Her husband passed away, and Juliet became the owner and of Orleans Republican and publisher. Uh, and that was quite something, because women at that time did not own businesses like that, let alone run them. But she got it from her husband passing away, and she ran the newspaper. Um, Juliet was born in Milton, Vermont, August 20th, 1829, the daughter of Alexander and Harriet Hayward. Her family moved to Albion, and she married Calvin Beach in 1850. Mr. Beach was a printer from Rochester who came to Albion to become a partner of J.O. Wilsey in the publication of the Orleans American newspaper. In 1860, Calvin became the sole proprietor, but Calvin died eight years later. At the time of his death, Juliet was 39 years old with five children, ages 14, 12, 5, 3, and 6 months. Yet Juliet took over management and editing of the newspaper for the next three years until her oldest son took over as editor. Juliet kept the ownership of the newspaper until 1900, when at the age of 71, she passed away. Juliet's contributions were not limited to Orleans County publications or literary scene. Early in her life, she developed literary talent in both prose and poetry and became a regular contributor to some of the leading magazines and family papers of the country. Her first published effort was a poem published in a Tennessee paper operated by Parson Brownlow. Later during the Civil War, some of her patriotic verses gained a wide circulation. Before her husband's death, Juliet and he were frequent visitors to New York City and became acquainted with Henry Clapp, editor of the Saturday Press. Juliet was an admirer of Walt Whitman and discussed this with Henry Clapp. In 1860, Mr. Clapp advised Walt Whitman to send a copy of Leaves of Grass to Juliet and ask her to review it. So Walt Whitman is sending a, a copy of his book, Leaves of Grass, <coughs> to our newspaper editor, Juliet Beach, to ask her for her opinion which I think is quite something. <laughs> Apparently, Calvin intercepted the letter, read the, pro pro read the publication, and wrote a scathing review, <laughs> signing Juliet's name. The article was published June 2nd, but after heated correspondence with Juliet, when she vehemently denied writing the review, on June 9th, Clapp printed a correction saying, the article in our last issue was written not by her, but by Mr. Beach. Juliet's article finally appeared on June 23rd, merely signed, A Woman. She promoted Leaves of Grass as having a deep spiritual significance and pre predicted that it would become the standard book of poems in the future of America. Some also believe the poem, Out of the Rolling Ocean, the Crowd, was written by Whitman for Juliet but as of yet, it's not proven. They, they've got a lot of evidence that leans towards that, that it was written for Juliet by Walt Whitman. Uh, <clears throat> this is, uh, was in the newspaper. This is the Yates County newspaper. Um, Mrs. Juliet Beach has assumed the management of the Orleans Republican published at Albion and lately under the ownership and direction of her husband, now deceased. If more of the Democratic papers were conducted by ladies, it would no doubt end, tend to the moral, if not political, improvement of the Democrat Party. <laughs> so get the ladies in the newspapers, will you please? That would help a lot. Uh, <laughs> um, and also, there is a section online 
that is the Walt Whitman archive, okay? <coughs> and it is his letters and things he's written and information on his life. And guess what? Juliet Beach is in here. Um, journalist, editor, and owner of the Orleans Republican, a newspaper published in Albion, New York. Beach also wrote and published prose and poetry in magazines and newspapers. Her patriotic verse was widely circulated during the Civil War. She married Calvin Beach in 1850. At his death, Juliet became owner, manager, and editor of the newspaper, unusual for a woman in the 19th century. Um, Beach and her husband occasionally visited New York City, and they knew Henry Clapp, editor of the Saturday Press. Clapp advised Whitman to send a copy of his 1860 Leaves of Grass to Juliet for review. On the 2nd of June, 1860, a review was published in Saturday Press. It was unfavorable, calling the children of Adam poems disgusting and describing Whitman as a poet who possessed strength and beauty but no soul. Calvin Beach, who had, oh, and also advising Whitman to drown himself. <laughs> Calvin Beach, who had in intercepted Leaves of Grass and read it, apparently wrote this first review himself and submitted it to the Saturday Press unsigned. Clapp mistakenly appended Juliet's initials to it and a week later had to print a retraction. <laughs> so, um, Calvin, I think, was a little jealous <clears throat> because Whitman was paying attention to his wife. Um, on, on the 23rd of June, a second review of Leaves of Grass appeared in Saturday Press. This time, the review, written by Juliet Beach and signed a woman, described Leaves of Grass as the standard book of poems in the future of America and Whitman as an embodiment of the new genesis. So she was very positive about it, and she got her, her turn at writing a review. Um, there's, there's several places that, that um, show how Juliet was very influential in Whitman's writings, that he took her advice and wrote back and forth to her, apparently, quite a bit. Um, she and her husband had gone to New York a couple times and they did meet with Whitman once or twice, so they actually, she actually got to meet him. But um, she was someone that everybody was looking at as, oh, they're writing back and forth, are they? You know, there's something going on here. Uh, <laughs> which I thought was really cute. But she was only one. She was the first one. Um, Later on, Sophia Wells Royce Williams. Sophia Wells Royce was born in New York in um, 1850. She was one of the Royce family in Albion. Um, the family was descended from three brothers who left Wales about 1730 and settled in New England. Origen and Julius Royce, who for many years were identified with some of the best interests in Albion and who alone of the family came to this county, were sons of Origen and Hannah Fay Royce. Origen Rice Sr. left Mansfield, Connecticut about 1818 and settled in Broome County, thence moved to Cortland County. In his family were seven children and of them, Osro, James Felder, Julius Heath, and Origen came to Western New York. <clears throat> um, they were known, some of the, the boys were known as strong abolitionists in the county and later uh, an equally strong Republican. At the time of, the, of his death, he was the elder of the Presbyterian Church, and he married Francis Henrietta Heaven. Havens, and to them three children were born, Elizabeth, who married George Frederick Sawyer, Charles, who married Alice Casey Carrington and now lives in New York City, Francis Havens Royce, died December 4, 1870, 
and two years after Origen married Kezia Dunn, by whom he had one child, Oretta Stewart Royce. Origen Royce Jr. died April 19, 1884. George F. Sawyer and Elizabeth H. Royce were married November 5, 1866, and two children were born to them, Charles Royce Sawyer of Albion and a daughter who died in infancy. George F. Sawyer was a native of the county and spent several years of his life in the naval service. In Albion, he was a merchant and he died in 1878. Julius Royce was born in Broome County in 1819. His life in Albion was devoted to mercantile pursuits, he being for many years in the hardware business, a part of the time in pursuit of his brother Origen, a partnership, excuse me, of his, in his, with his brother. He was also identified with other interests and associations of many public improvements. Julius, the pioneer of the family in this county, first locating in Clarendon, then coming to Albion in 1848, where he died in 1888. In Hartford, Oneida County, November, October 25th, 1848, he married Harriet Amelia Wells, by whom they had three children, Sophia, who married Talcott Williams in Philadelphia, George Fay, now of the West, and Harriet, wife of George M. Lewis of New York City. Harriet Wells Royce died, 1891. So there's quite a connection of the Royce family with Orleans County. Um, <coughs> Um, <coughs> Sophia Wells Royce married Talcott Williams. Now, Talcott Williams meant absolutely nothing to me when I found it. It, it was her last name, it was her husband, and that's all I knew about him. But he was quite an, an, an important man at that time. Um, and they did live most of their life in the New York City area. But Talcott Williams was an American journalist, author, and educator. In 1912, Talcott Williams became the first director of the newly founded Columbia School of Journalism at Columbia University, built and endowed by Joseph Pulitzer. So he was quite an impressive man. This is Sophia's husband. <coughs> Talcott Williams was a member of the American Philosophical Society and served with the National Security League, advocating for the promotion of useful knowledge by serving on the Committee of Organi Organized Education. <clears throat> Talcott Williams was born in Turkey, the son of William Frederick and Sarah <coughs> Amelia Talcott, Talcott Williams, Congregational Ministers with the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions. So, Sophia's husband was born in Turkey. Talcott Williams came to New York at the age of 15 and enrolled in 1866 at the Phillips Academy in Andover, Massachusetts, graduating in 1869. Talcott Williams studied at Amherst College and was a member of Alpha Delta Phi. Talcott Williams became, began his career in journalism as a reporter for the New York World and as a correspondent for the New York Sun. Talbot Williams married in 1879 his distant cousin, Sophia Wells Royce. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> in 1912, Talcott Williams left the Philadelphia Press to become the first director of the newly founded Columbia School of Journalism, built and endowed by Joseph Pulitzer. Talcott Williams understood and wrote about the influence that the press had in regards to public opinion and Talbot Williams promoted the idea that a good, good journalist required a strong academic background. So this was Sophia's husband. So you can see why she had ends with writers at the time and influential people at the time. Um, in Philadelphia, Sophia Wells Royce Williams and her husband Talbot Williams were close friends with Thomas Aiken, who painted both of them. The Philadelphia Museum of Art preserves the oil painting called the Black Fan, portrait of Mrs. Talcott Williams. Well, apparently, 
Sophia was interested in photography. And there again, not a place where a woman at that time period was thought to be competent. I mean, after all, you know. Um, but she proved them wrong. Uh, and you don't have to take these home if you don't want them. If you want them, you can have them. This is a picture of Walt Whitman that for years had been um, said it was taken by Thomas Akins. It, this one isn't. It was taken by Sophia Wells Royce. She, you can see that he, she would know, knew um, Walt Whitman if she was in his house that close to him yeah. enough to take a picture. And we have, in, in fact, it wasn't until 1986 that they verified that, that picture was taken by her and not Thomas Aikens. So it's been a debate for years. But I thought it was interesting to see this picture of Walt Whitman in his own house was taken by an Albion girl. Mm -hmm. uh, it shows how close they were, mm -hmm. that he would allow her in his house, and she took a picture of him. And they've been for years fighting about whether this was taken by Sophia or whether it was taken by Thomas Akins. And they have proved, they found another copy of it and it was signed Sophia Wells Royce on the back of it. So um, he, was, he was somebody that these women knew. He was somebody that, in essence, they helped him. He, they were a source for him. And I think that Walt Whitman at the time, yes, he was becoming famous, but it wasn't the same Walt Whitman we think of, you know? He was writing and he was producing things and these couple of ladies were his friends. And um, this, this is kind of cute. This was a note written by Sophia Wells Royce Williams to Mr. Whitman. This is February 16th, 1888. My dear Mr. Whitman, my small colored boy is the bearer of a note to Mr. Rice, asking him to dine with us at 6.15 this evening, going afterward with me to the Thomas concert for which I have tickets. If Mr. Rise is not in when the boy reaches your house, will you kindly send me word by the boy as to the probabilities of his being able to come? As you may perchance know his en engagements. If he is anywhere near, any place near, will you send the boy to him with his note, please? I'm sorry to trouble you, but shall be very greatly obliged. I hope this cold weather is treating you more kindly than last. Very cordially, Sophia Wells Royce Williams. Uh, that alone to me proves that they were just casual friends. Mm -hmm. They, I mean, she went to his house, took his picture. Uh, she asked him to send a note along to somebody else to, to eat with her. Um, I, it just amazed me that on the internet I could find the personal um, letters. That that letter is on the Walt Whitman archive also. You can find both of the Albion women on that archive. <coughs> um, Sophia was, let's see, where is she? In 1895, the Civic Club in Philadelphia circulated to the Municipal League and to city newspapers the names of women who were willing to serve as school directors if supported by the Republican and Democrat leadership. The Municipal League responded by nominating two women, including Sophia Wells Royce Williams for the 7th District, which roughly corresponded to today's Society Hill neighborhood, 
The Civic Club organized a campaign committee which promoted the women. The committee then organized a widespread canvas of eligible voters. In spite of their involvement, neither secured the election. Her effort to run for school board reflected what historians have called social housekeeping movement of the period, which represented an early foray for women in electoral politics. So she was right in there, in the fight, still trying for a place that was normally given to a man. <clears throat> she didn't give up on it. She tried it in lots of areas. Um, Talcott Williams was born in Turkey, and she and Talcott would go back and forth between the United States and Turkey, traveling. Sylvia Wells Royce Williams and her husband Talcott traveled to Morocco from 1897 to 1898 and collected hundreds of objects which they donated to the Penn Museum. In 2020, 15 of these objects were on public display. Some of the objects are pottery created in the 1890s that feature ornate blue pattering and a shiny glaze. The collection also includes wooden carvings, clothing, food containers, Arabic manuscripts, woven baskets, and more. During the same exposition, Sophia Wells Royce Williams and Talbot took photographs and collected objects which they donated to the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. Currently, the Smithsonian Institute online catalog <laughs> attributes 280 objects in its collection to Talcott Williams. The Smithsonian does not cite Sophia Wells Royce Williams, who also collected and donated objects. So they were there. She got some praise, not so much in other places. Because <laughs> after all, she was just a woman. Mm -hmm. uh, um, let's see, that's, I guess that's as much as I know about Sophia. Uh, and the, the uh, Walt Whitman picture, I think, is quite a phenomenon in that it was taken by an Albion girl. Um, that's a little bit of status that we didn't know we had. Does anybody have any questions? I know I went through some of it kind of fast. Mm -hmm. yeah, did, did the women ever connect with each other? No, no, not that I know of. Um, they were the same time period? No, uh, Julia, Julia was earlier. Mm -hmm. She was earlier. And um, Sophia married and then moved out of the county. She was born and raised here, but she was, she moved out of the county. So they might have known each other in passing, but not, you know, to know what each other did in their own lives. Um, so Juliet was first, and then Sophia was after her. But it tickles me that they were both friends of Walt Whitman. Who would have ever thought? Yeah. Uh, I don't know that they do. Um, I don't think Sophia and Talbot had children. As of right now, I haven't found that they have. Juliet and Calvin had children. Remember, because they were like five, five yeah. from 14 down to six, six months. months. Mm -hmm. So there could well be. I haven't traced it to find out. But I think your better shot is the Beach family, not uh, Sophia Wells, I think. Yeah. I found it interesting that her son, if, if the numbers are right, he was 12 when his father died. She took over the business for three years until he took it over at 15. Right. So a 15-year-old boy was more qualified than a four. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's yeah. I tell you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but also, she was, she was, I think he was 14 when his father died. So that would have made him 17. 17. That's a couple of years. Mm -hmm. But still, she felt he should have the business, not her. You know, and but it's a sign of the times. It was unusual for her to own that business and run it anyway. 
because her husband died. But then she waited for her oldest son. I wonder if she enjoyed it. I don't know. I think she probably did. I, in that she did, of course, I know she would have kept it for the heritage of her, her children. Um, but I think she was competent enough in writing herself that running it was not. And we can find some of the newspapers during that time period that says uh, <coughs> editor. Juliet H. Um, so she has her name on the, the upper part of the newspaper. So she did take credit for it. Yeah. Which I think alone, that's that's interesting that she would put it in print. Yeah. You know, because I mean, after all, she was just a woman. Mm -hmm. You know, I think she can run this business. Anybody else have any questions? It almost in this picture looks like somebody is looking at something out that window. That yeah, I don't know whether that's a, that or a curtain. Yeah, I don't know either. I think it might be a curtain, but... Yeah, the curtain's pulled back. The yeah. The curtain pulled back. It almost looked like his hand <laughs> up there with a... Yeah. After he moved into this house, he was... He had some problems with walking, like partially paralyzed. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's why people came to him. Camden, New Jersey. Camden, C A M D E M. You know, the, remember the game authors that mm -hmm. used to play? Yeah. So, I've never known him to look any different than right I know. Now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And if you go on the internet and, and type in Walter Whitman, um, Walt Whitman, you're going to see if you go to images. You can see all different images of him. And there's a couple of him as a young man. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 Which I hadn't seen before. But um, I hadn't really researched him before either. Um, but he always does <laughs> anything you think, Walt well, Whitman, you think of this man with the beard yeah, and awesome. the bald head. Yeah. 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 Long white beard. Yeah. And what are Walt Whitman's ties to Elmian? Walt Whitman? Yeah. Where is Just his ties are through... <clears throat> Juliet, Just who the ran writing. the newspaper. Okay. Yeah, so and Sophia. In yeah. Albion. He wasn't in Albion, but there were two women from Albion yeah. that were quite that close he was to him. Close to yeah. Him. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he was never here. He wasn't ever physically here in Albion. He wrote back and forth to Juliet quite a bit mm -hmm. because she was the editor of the newspaper, and she wrote columns on poetry and. Mm -hmm you know, recent writings and things like that. So she was known for that. But in that day and age, it was all letters back and forth. Yeah. And Sophia... And you, and you she said that she was questioned a little on those letters? Uh, yeah. Was she sent him a... a about well, he sent her a copy of Leaves of Grass for her input. Mm -hmm. And Calvin got a hold of it. And so she wrote, was still married at that time. Oh, yeah. And uh, even on the internet, you can find his letter, which just lambastes Walt Whitman and says how terrible this leaves of grass is and it's impertinent and it's just, he goes ranting on about how bad and then signs her name. <laughs> okay, so he wanted Walt Whitman to think that she had turned on him. I'm not sure, but I believe a lot of people didn't know him. When he first began, Walt Whitman, yeah, because his form was free. It was free form, yeah, and it was very passionate and yeah, and unlike it, any of any other structure and unlike any other topic. Yeah, and the implication was some even thought he was homosexual because mm -hmm. of what he wrote. And on the other hand, Calvin Beach thought he was after his wife. Mm -hmm. um, and nobody says today they decided which way he was. Mm -hmm. But he wrote very clearly, passionately, mm -hmm. and sexually, you know, loving someone and, you know, that sort of thing. So that was kind of, wow, like a woman being the editor of a newspaper was, wow, you know, it just didn't happen. So he was like cutting edge he was, yeah. of, of modern poetry. There's a, I just wanted to share with everybody if they're mm -hmm. interested, um, I apologize for having my cell phone out, but I was looking for this to share with you. It's on the podcast In Our Time, 
It's a BBC podcast, mm-hmm. and there's an entire episode, 50 minutes, on Walt Whitman. Uh-huh. And there's a reading of a poem much like that, uh-huh. passionate, love, you know, sex, all that. And right. There's a reading of a poem, and I was driving late one night, and I was listening to this, and the, the reading of that poem took my breath away. Yeah. Um, in fact, somebody a few days later said, oh, well, I found this poem, and it's such a nice poem. And I said, that's not a poem, and I read it this <laughs> <one>. <laughs> you know? Um, so it's, it, I can't remember the name of it, but it's, it's a good reading of that poem. You can find the poem online, but I can write that down for anybody that wants it. It's yeah. a, it's a really good 50 minutes about Walt Whitman. Uh-huh. So. Yeah. He was, he really was, he was new and different. That's one reason he caught on. Mm-hmm. Um, and Leaves of Grass, I don't, I don't even, I remember how many, um, versions, how many editions of Leaves of Grass, like nine, where he kept updating and adding and updating and adding, and that, that got to be his signature. So he wasn't famous when he was alive. He got famous. Uh, he was getting famous. Yes, he famous. Yeah, not. yeah. Mm-hmm. But he's more famous now than he was then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One of those things, yeah. I think we know now when we look back his significance, but it couldn't be seen at the time. Right. Yeah. yeah, but it, it's like things you remember like 30, 40 years ago. Things that weren't, they're, oh yeah, mm-hmm. and now they're famous mm-hmm. today. Yeah. You know, after they've lasted a period of time, old Walt Whitman was like that. Mm-hmm. He was a poet, yeah. Mm-hmm. He hung out in New York City, yeah. and, and it was kind of like an underground bar where he and fellow poets hung out. Mm-hmm. Um, well, he got inspired to write his poetry. Um, so he was kind of bohemian. And at the time, you know, you don't think about those people. Until later on, when you realize what they were producing, they were writing these stories and or, or poetry or whatever that become famous today. Yeah. Hmm. Anybody else? Well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Hope you.